Paulus sus sus progresos. Now begin to think about two years and what can we do for tomorrow? And what are the things that we can do to assess, to train, to learn, to unlearn, and all of those questions. You know, we hope that we have a very interesting, we'll get answers to all of that from our panelists today. And uh, to head the panel, we have a person who needs no introduction, Vipul. Uh, he is uh, one of the founders of CS Pachala and a very, very active me community member. He is also a distinguished scientist at uh, TCS and now actively participating only in computational thinking. And uh, we hope that now he'll be able to take the panel forward and get questions from you all and answer them, and as well as from the esteemed panelists, which uh, he will introduce. So without much further ado, let's uh, hand it over to Vipul and take it ahead. Thank you, Vipul. Uh, good morning, all. Yeah, I, I like that. I think it was louder than your good morning. Uh, <laughs> 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 Maybe you woke them up. Yeah. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I think we had a, a wonderful, wonderful day yesterday, and I hope you agree with me on that. Uh, wonderful talks by Tim Bell, Uri, and uh, I think uh, it just set the stage, and followed by a set of t presentations from the teacher. It was wonderful to hear of the different ways in which they are implementing computational thinking in schools. So I think the last several years, uh, there has been a buzz around CT, AI, coding, especially since the national education policy has been <coughs> announced, right? I mean, you hear these words everywhere around us. and. Uh, and I'm talking in the respect of K-12 to education. Hmm. Now, there is a research available, educational research that is available that uh, uh, I mean it's almost inside. Yeah. Speak like so this. <laughs> Keep it like this. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there is research that is around us, research that identifies uh, that has investigated that there are several significant benefits to teaching uh, computer science and computational thinking in K to 12. Yeah, yeah. So uh, today I'm fortunate to have, as uh, Nikhil mentioned, an esteemed panel here with solid experience in the education sector. And amongst many things, what we'd like to discuss today is where are we with respect to uh, CT, CS in K-12 education, and what's the way ahead? What's the way forward? Right? So I think before we get started, let me very quickly introduce our panelists. Let me start, uh, uh, I think, let me start with Rita. Uh, I'll start from this. Uh, and so Rita Panse is a vice principal at the School of Scholars, Mega Group of Schools. She is, incidentally, a science teacher, uh, teaching grades 9 and 10. And uh, she has a teaching experience over 16 years. Uh, teaching is her passion, and she's always ready to adopt new skills and technology. Next, we have Varath. <laughs> Varath is a content leader at uh, Educational Initiatives, EI. Uh, EI has uh, launched an assessment product on computational thinking, uh, Asset CT, last year. And they are now working on a learning product, MindSpark CT. Uh, Varath has previously founded a bootstrapped edtech startup in English learning space that scaled to half a million users. Uh, he's uh, an IITN, Madras, and then an IIM Bangalore graduate. Uh, Mukesh, I, mean, I, I don't know, many of you may uh, not know this, but the very first time we met when we conceptualized uh, uh, the CS Parshala program, Mukesh was one of the early uh, people involved since then, and he gave us a lot of inputs uh, at that point in time. So Mukesh is a vice principal at uh, uh, DPS uh, RK Puram, and he has a rich uh, experience, uh, illustrious career spanning over 33 years in education, as an educator. Last but, the least, last but not the least, Vishnu, Vishnu Agnihotri, is a co-founder of Genwise, 
again, a co organization we have been associated for a few years now, uh, an organization that runs programs for gifted students. Uh, Genwise programs help students develop critical thinking skills, gain awareness about different domains across science and humanities, and develop social emo emotional skills. Vishnu has over 18 years of experience in school education. So as you can see that we have uh, rich experience in education sector amongst the panel here. And Vishnu has a BTEC from IIT Madras. Again, another IIT Madras uh, alumni here. All right. So I think let's get started. So I think the way I would like to structure our discussion, it will be a little, we'll see how it goes based on your questions, your reactions as well. Uh, but around uh, starting with saying, what is CT all about? What's this buzz all about? You know? Then we want to get into pedagogy. I think that's one of the most important elements for you. And then talk about what are the burning needs? What are the training needs? Assessment. I think a lot of you have come and said, OK, how do we assess CT? And finally, talk about what is the way ahead? What is the future? Where are we headed? Right? So I think let me start with the very first one. And one of the things we noticed yesterday a lot of our speakers, and incidentally, when you hear about a talk on CT, a lot of people like to start with Janet Wing's uh, statement, right? And I'll be no different here. I will also start with that and uh, say that, I mean, Janet Wing made the statement that CT is formulating a seemingly difficult problem into one we know how to solve, perhaps by reduction, embedding, transformation, or simulation. I mean, or in other simpler words that we have been using, a computational thinking is a thought process involved in formulating problems and the solutions so that the solutions are represented in a form that can uh, be effectively be carried out by human or computers, right? Now, this statement was made in a paper she published, or an article she published in 2006. The world has been changing around us, right? I mean, at a tremendous pace. And I keep saying that, uh, just the phone that we have in our pockets is a great example of that. How long have we come since uh, 2006? Right? Uh, the processing power in the phones we have is far more than what we had or far more than supercomputers 20, 30 years ago. So given this, given that the change is around us, largely enabled by technology, how do you put Janet Swing's statement in the context now? W w how do you put, what's the perspective you would like to take? if I may request right. you. Yeah, so I mean, I completely agree with Janet Wing's statement about, you know, technology moving at uh, such a fast pace, then therefore computational thinking is, you know, very critical and important. So there is, unfortunately, there is a lag between where the world is, where top people, whether they are scientists or architects or engineers or politicians or whatever, what they are thinking, what, what kind of tools they are using to solve problems and manage things, and what we are able to teach children in school, there is always a lag. And I don't think we can uh, help it much. We'll have to figure out a way. So for example, Newton and Leibniz calculus was you know, invented like so many years ago. Uh, 200, 300 years ago, but it came into the curriculum in uh, colleges only in around 1920. But the moment you know calculus, you can do so many things, or algebra even, right? So even though smartphones have come, so many things have happened, and we've learned to do these things, we have not started to learn how to think, how to think now that computers are there, there are different ways of thinking to leverage the power of computers. So we may have learned PowerPoint or Excel or whatever, but unless we are computer scientists and so on, and even programmers sometimes are not so strong at computational thinking, right? So one of uh, my friends, Naveen Kabra, who also works at Genwise, he talks about these BTEC students who are you know, uh, coming for programming jobs, and they're not able to write an algorithm for buttered toast, they miss out steps, they don't give precise enough uh, instructions. So uh, certainly I fully agree with this. And there is a lot of technology change in terms of tools which are available. Of course, there is your Google spreadsheet and Excel, and, and ca it can do a lot, right? Um, and there are various other tools, maybe, you know, uh, it'll get discussed today. So there are, for, uh, okay, one example I want to give is, uh, there was a person called Tom Schelling who got the Nobel Prize, I think, uh, for work he did in the 60s, it was about segregation of communities, like, you know, whites and blacks are living in different parts in the US. So because of the kind of 
things available at that time, computers, he actually in his drawing room, he put colored tokens and he was doing it. And he got the Nobel Prize for that work about why micro motives and macro behavior, it's called if someone is interested. Today, a six standard middle school student using a net logo model, go and check out parable of the polygons, right? He can reach the same conclusions as a Nobel Prize winning scientist because these tools are available today. But this is very scattered, right? Teachers, schools don't know about it. So I do agree fully with her and there is a lot of stuff. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, I'd like to kind of approach it from the way EI would look at it, uh, the company I represent. So EI has been in the space of education for more than a couple of decades now. And a large reason why we exist is that students, both in private schools as well as government schools in India, if, if I can take the Indian context, uh, have struggles in terms of understanding concepts. And to the extent that uh, medicine, we keep falling back on medicine as a field where tremendous achievements have happened over the past 80, 100 years, where earlier, uh, a century ago, the no, the value that a patient got by getting admitted in a hospital was fairly limited. But after penicillin was discovered and after the tremendous achievements that uh, pharma and health industries have done, there is a lot of uh, benefit in a person getting quality medical care now. So the uh, And we are able to kind of give it with a lot of efficacy that if a certain person exhibits certain symptoms, a problem is diagnosed, you can solve for that with a certain pill and it's expected to solve for it 99% of the time. Whereas the same thing hasn't happened for someone who says has an English grammar problem or a math, he doesn't understand fractions. How do you then under, help the child understand that and how do you have a solution for that that will solve for it 99% of the time? So what we're seeing is in one space, in medicine, we've kind of nearly solved all of those problems. We saw it in the pandemic that vaccines were made available fairly quickly. Yes, there were deaths, but that we were able to solve for it from a scientific point of view is something uh, to show for the progress we've made in the field of medicine. Whereas education, if you take only the limited space of reading, math, basic science, we are still struggling to come up with the best teaching tools for those subjects. But at the same time, what we're seeing, uh, as Vipul and uh, Vishnu mentioned, is that the world is changing. It's not enough for kids to know only English, math, science you also need them to know all these other sciences, other skills that are rec going to be required. And the kind of jobs that are going to be uh, made available for kids when they move out of schools is going to require them to think differently. So as while we are teaching English, while we're teaching math, science, I think it also becomes imperative for us to help kids navigate this world where they'll have to apply what they're learning try to think about some of these things in newer domains that probably don't exist right now. And that is how I kind of see why we need to kind of look at computational thinking from an educator's point of view. Uh, thank you, Vishnu and Varad. I'd like to follow this up, saying now that you say that this is important, what do you think we should be teaching uh, kids, right? What is CT? I think yesterday there were a few questions around, okay, is there CT, is there advanced CT? And uh, so the question it is, is there this notion that there is something that everybody should be learning? And is this something which a few students who perhaps for whatever criteria we use uh, uh, are maybe gifted or otherwise, but something which uh, so, you know, more advanced or something can be, uh, they should be doing. So maybe I'll just open it up. Anybody, any of you would like to take this? Uh. Good morning, everyone. So I will just take three parameters. One is present status of our children in the classroom, present status of mindset and the level of the teachers. The second is what content should be taught. And third, how to be taught. The present status is chat GPT and open AI has opened a window which can take our children to any direction. So it is a omni-direction kind of thing, situation, where any child just types one prompt and get his problem solved. So there is nothing kind of homework you can give to the child 
to do it from home because the child who is smarter will not put in any effort and come back with the smartest homework solution, right? And the child who has put in effort, you will say that he has not done it well. So it is a very challenging situation. And what we need, we need to teach remains the same as far as CT is concerned. When the computers started, the three things we learned that there is something called input, output, and in between some process sits. That is what we learned in our school, colleges. And if you ask your previous generation, they also learned the same. Right. In process, we learned three things. They remain the same today also. Sequencing, branching, and looping. Did they change? These are the basic things we are expected to teach every single child. This is completely different than teaching coding. We are not talking about the syntax. We are talking about what child should know. Every child should know what is the meaning of sequencing, how to place things one after another. In different sequence, that will have a different meaning. Second, branching, what to decide whether to go to left, right, whether to do this or that. This is very important for every single child. Looping, repeating the same situation again and again until and unless something which terminates it. Looping again has the two things. One is finiteness of loop and infiniteness of loop. For example, sunrise and sunset is the best example for infinite loop, right? Nothing can be better than this. If you talk about a daily schedule of the child, daily schedule of the child stops. First period, learn. Second period, learn. Third period, learn. Fourth period, learn. Break. Stop learning, start eating, enjoying, and just do socializing with friends, right? So this is the loop got terminated over there, right? So similar kind of examples they need to understand. If you go to airport, child should know if they are seeing that huge panel in which number of flights and timings are there, how to locate his or her flight. I have seen some people just traverse through that big screen and they are able to grasp it. Some people stand there for almost 15 minutes, still they are not able to locate there. Why? It's just that their mind is not synchronized with sequencing. If they know that, I just have to look at the time. I know my flight time is 5.40. So I just see that it is sorted on time. I'll just locate my flight. Either it will be one up or one down if it is delayed. Right? Not more than that. Second thing, if I have to uh, travel to Pune from Delhi, I'll just see the target destination. If it is Pune, there are few Pune flights might be flying. I'll locate it very fast. So these are the techniques we need to teach essentially to each child, whether it is today, tomorrow, or after a certain number of years. This will remain constant. I hope you argue, agree with me. So people think that with introduction of open ai and chat gpt our thought process should should stop thinking about teaching these kind of concepts in the class these are going to be essentially required the person who knows ct well will be able to utilize these tools much beautifully than anybody else right so how I have covered. Mukesh, perhaps the next one we can cover in the next section. Yeah, yeah, this. perfectly right. Totally Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any quick comment, Rita, on this? Yeah, I fully agree with what sir has quoted few examples. And uh, I would just like to say uh, one thing. Okay. Why now? Because children are very small. And now it's a time if you are diverting them towards computational thinking, stepwise approach and problem solving. So right now we are making them to comfortable for the future which is coming ahead and they have to deal with all these things in future. 
so what we are learning now they will be learning in their childhood so that will be always better for them that's why city should be there for the students thank you thank you so what yeah 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 please so why does any subject need to be learned right so i think there are two three reasons like professor hura is his name from uh, ets zurich the yura. professor yura yura okay so what like professor yura the first thing he mentioned was in education you must learn about your surroundings so that you can participate in solving problems contributing to building the world so at genwise we have this idea of uh, versatilist like a t shaped individual so the top of the t is so the vertical thing is you should have expertise in one or two things maybe you know math well maybe you know you know computer science well or you know it could be history or civics or whatever but you also have a broad thing so the top of the t is telling you that okay you must know a little bit about the other things uh, also and why is this important because only then will you be able to engage with other people very few specialists are needed in the world lot more of these versatilists are needed so you need you know one thing well but you know enough about the other thing so now so maybe let us say vipul is a computer scientist and he has to solve the traffic problem in pune right he should be smart enough to know that it is not just a computational thinking problem he should know that he needs to get some policy economic incentives and all that uh, go on i'll let me take the example of traffic it will make it clearer so if i look at it from the lens of an architect urban planner designer i will say road should be like this if i look at it from the point of view of a computer scientist they will say that you know if vehicles can communicate with each other or traffic signals are you know done in such a way and optimize something will happen so computational thinking is one of the very important lenses so you need to uh, have uh, so everybody should know some bit of computational thinking yesterday there was a t lot of talk about the computer scientist view i am not a computer scientist and i can tell you that i, I love the example of the you know uh, board in the airport right so you are not thinking sorting and if you don't do that probably you will not sort your excel sheet also and you will struggle uh, with doing things right so uh, i would say that uh, uh, one reason why uh, ct should uh, children should be exposed to is because they are at least aware they may not become computer scientists themselves but they are aware that this is a problem which is more easily solved by uh, computer scientists so let me at least catch a computer scientist and have that conversation with them the other thing i want to quickly add and maybe in the future part i will get more into it the way you learn something can be completely different now that computers are there so for those of you interested i'll share a link so learning about a falling object so some of your physics teachers here so if your physics teachers in grade 9 perhaps you have all you know the equations of motion and all of that we learnt it in a particular way but today there are tools there is something called ct stem from northwestern learning sciences department you can drop a ball every show me after 1 second where it is and automatically on the side it will plot distance versus time velocity versus time and you know it will plot all kinds of things and you can even for me uh, who has done all these things it's a new insight so the way you learn things can be very different chemical uh, equilibrium a lot of students think that it is a static thing it's a dynamic thing with both sides things happening and but we are still teaching the way we were taught yeah. no i think thank you already i think this is a good segue into the next section where i wanted to talk uh, get your uh, thoughts on uh, there are many approaches to ct right some people have to, we cs partial and a few others have taken an unplugged approach trying to look at uh, activities around us what we see around us and drawing upon that to uh, build examples uh, the other end there are approaches where ct is seen with programming and you have a lot of approaches around that and there are people in between uh, i think what you brought out is another aspect saying that okay how should we teach ct uh, should we look at it as a computing subject uh, at stand alone should we integrate it into uh, other subjects and i i really like to uh, get your thoughts uh, on uh, uh, 
what, how do you think we should, uh, from a pedagogical perspective, uh, where should CT is? Is there a one way or uh, how are the different ways one could look at it? And again, I would like you to request if you could share your experience in this, especially having taught uh, science uh, in school. Yes. CT is very well uh, applicable to all the subjects. Earlier it was like that, it is limited to only the computer science or mathematics. And even a normal teacher's thinking was like that only. Okay, it is not of my uh, cup of tea, it should be with mathematics and science. But now when we have practically applied in the classroom, especially for the subjects where it is very difficult to explain each and everything to the students, so at that time when you are taking them and giving them task and expecting solutions from them, so you should give opportunity to the child to explore. Instead of directing them what they have to do, let them explore the things and when they are doing, for example, just now uh, we have tried this in our school that uh, hydrocarbons models, they, have, they were supposed to be uh, modeled. And in that, when it is told them that this is the task which has been given to you and you have to come up with the solutions. Now it is early age to know all three dimensional approach and all because it is just a beginning. But still looking at today's scenario, it is important and they can explore on their own. So they have started searching because we have given only one theme that is a hydrocarbon. Then they have started searching what should I do, what it should be. Then as we are writing on no notebook, they were just preparing model like 2D model only. What we write on the notebook, they have just uh, reflected in the same manner. Then there is a group of students, always it is there in a class of 40, few students are really bright. So they always go ahead beyond the imagination and they have searched that this can be designed in 3D way, but they don't have that su sufficient knowledge. Then they need, they need, to, need to explore. Then they have started finding out what can I do. The hydrocarbon family is so vast. So let us select one compound which will be easily systematically modeled. Then they have come up with the solutions. Then there were many issues like how to select the material. They were not aware because the first material that they could get is clay or something like that. They have taken, they have started designing that they could not succeed. Then one child, one of the one of them have come up with some other solution. Then they have started using aluminium foils, which are lighter, which can give them uh, dimensional figures and all. So likewise, means it was beyond imagination what they did, and they came up with their own solutions, own uh, identifications, and they could reach to the means appropriate results. So this is how this is one example so it can be implemented in all the subjects i think for science it can be done very successfully because always in science we talk about stepwise even in practicals or any process we are explaining any diagram they are drawing so they have to follow some steps so there they can very well implement this abstraction decomposition and then algorithm so it is very very successful effort so i think it we can go ahead with the science and uh, more subjects also. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Rita. Uh, Mukesh, from your, uh, maybe this is the time for you to uh, talk about the. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, all of us uh, might be fail, uh, facing a bigger challenge in the classroom that there are some children in the class, th there are two to eight percent varying uh, place to place, who are extremely fast learners. And whatever you are teaching is useless for them. And they feel bored and they start troubling in the class. It happens quite normally all across all the schools, right? So we need to identify these people and uh, we, try, we should try to give them some problem which can help the entire class. Like they can help you out as uh, your trainer front ends who can sit with small groups and uh, help them learn faster, right? Another thing, never try to compete with your children. They will remain smarter than you in finding out solutions for those problems which you would never think of, right? 
So sometimes I see the teachers start competing with the children, right? They think that uh, you you keep quiet. What I am telling is right. Today that is not the time. We have to know that every child is having computer at home and they will be able to find better solutions than what you can find. So instead of uh, becoming uh, harsh on him or her and telling them that uh, you keep quiet, we should just come along and say, oh, you are right. And uh, you should also help us in solving this task. And you should also become part of the uh, trainer in the classroom. So you should make small groups and assign them. And another thing I would like to suggest that uh, in computers especially, some children are very quick and they learn tools very fast. So whatever you are teaching is again absurd for them. So at that time, I would suggest that you create a club in the school and your computer club should have multiple departments within it because computer uh, CT is not about only coding. CT involves a lot of design aspect also, right? And your club should have all departments, and these departments' responsibility should be whatever they do, they should share it with maximum number of people. And this will reduce your load. At the same time, learning will multiply exponentially, right? And you will see the change. When the child gets that responsibility that he is responsible of creating something and then sharing with others, others appreciate that, that kind of achievement, I think, is going to be completely different. So you have solved both the tasks for you. One, the child was troubling and not allowing you to teach. At the same time, you have engaged him beautifully in such a way that the child has become useful in the class and helping others in the classroom. So that is what I, I feel that everyone should do. And we should become facilitators rather than become trainers. Right? Thanks, Mukesh. So if I may just add to that, yeah. uh, I think uh, similar to what the, the model that uh, we are speaking about, there are also uh, I mean, examples of where we've used CT to teach concepts in other subjects. So as much as we want to teach uh, uh, CT as a subject or as a skill, I think the more we're able to tightly integrate it with other subjects and have uh, students kind of experience some of these activities that will not only help them learn the subject, but also use what they've already learned in a subject to apply it using CT skills. So uh, Vishnu mentioned C2 STEM. Uh, C2 STEM has a module where uh, for straightforward mechanics, you they did this actual uh, rigorous study where half the class uh, were taught the usual way of teaching mechanics, and the other half had the usual mechanics lectures. But they also had the C2 STEM model where they had block-based coding kind of an interface for kids to figure out what kind of inputs would translate to a certain output. And they did the pre-post test to figure out that a student who goes through the integrated approach clearly is able to not only apply and learn the CT skills, but they've also learned the underlying physics skills a lot better. So I think the more we can find opportunities to do that, that will be useful. And slightly zooming out from that, it's also about how CT, the more we're able to expand it from away from just coding and if you want to become a software developer, then you should learn CT. If we can move away from that to say, irrespective of which line you take, if you're going to be a teacher, if you're going to be a journalist, whichever line, you, a person with CT skills is going to be that much better than a person who focuses only on the core domain. And to the extent that that message we're able to send out to kids and teachers and in therefore incorporate into as many aspects as possible, I think that's a win. Great, thanks. So uh, I think and Vishnu, I think, had a quick comment. Uh, and maybe then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, Vishnu, just before that, I think it was a good, we saw two examples here. Yeah. One, we're talking about hydrogen uh, modeling of uh, 
uh, uh, hydrocarbons. And the other one you're talking about C2 stem, we are talking about the mechanics part of it. And I think I believe from what I'm hearing, what you're saying is that uh, introducing practices or the dif perhaps a different way of thinking uh, aids learning. Right? And uh, yeah, or I understanding. Want so, on yeah. I want to comment on uh, both the examples of uh, Rita and uh, Varat. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad Varat brought it up. So, yesterday, when uh, uh, Professor Yura was talking about the goals, the first goal was learning about surroundings. Second thing was, you know, uh, language and math getting into it. Then I don't know if some of you remember, he talked about constructing things playing around and seeing whether something is working or not. So Seymour Papert, who's been quoted several times by Tim Bell and this thing. So Seymour Papert had a very interesting quote in one of the presentations yesterday where he says, it's not just about getting it right, it's like getting it to work. Now, so I am seeing that CT has this jugad mentality little bit in it, though it's a very strict discipline. And, and to be honest with you, this was not part of me. Right. Uh, so I have been in sessions where my teacher is uh, teaching a bunch of children. She's asked them a question and I'm trying to find an elegant mathematical solution and I'm not getting anywhere and the children have done do this, do this, do this sequence like in a CT way and they solved it. But because I have not used to it and I was not trained on it, even though I'm a fairly intelligent person, I don't uh, have that thing. So I think uh, the technical name, you don't need to bother, it's constructionism. So when you're constructing something, and construction doesn't have to be physical, it could be physical like Rita Ji's thing, or it could be, so you are, because you're engaging with it, playing around object, uh, how long it is taking, it is much easier for you to absorb the other things and you know, so I just wanted to share that quickly. Yeah, uh, and Mukesh, you have a quick comment from you? Uh, just wanted to add two things. Two things are very important. One is documentation, right? And another is uh, CT, right? Documentation can be done with the help of communication language, whatever communication language. So we have been, as Indians, very poor in documenting things, and that is why we lagged behind the world, right? We documented very less, and that is why whatever we did, people don't understand and they are not propagated, right? If you talk about US and UK, every single thing they do, they write steps for that. Step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do this. Step. However, they are very simple steps, right? But they are documented well so that it can be transferred to many people very easily, right? So communication language and CT combined together is going to be the future, whatever is specialization you do. Thank you. So I think I would like to continue from where you left it, uh, Vishnu, where you spoke about training. And I'd like to delve a little deeper into that. So with this buzz and with CT being talked about since uh, 2006, a lot of countries took initiative, including our own, uh, when us in NEP, where we said, OK, this is something we should be teaching. Many countries have gone ahead, created curriculum. But now if you reflect back and look at what has been happening in a lot of these countries over the years, you find there's a common theme that has been uh, uh, emerging. And the theme is, yes, there is a lack of confidence in the teachers in teaching something which is different. Something like you said, they have not been trained on, right? Uh, uh, there is obviously, and it can be attributed to lack of training perhaps, uh, lack of resources also. So uh, how do you, what do you think can be done to address this now that we are about to take this journey in India? And I would like to uh, get some thoughts on this uh, training needs. Wha where could uh, we start? What is it that we require? Is there any special background required from teachers? Uh, what kind of uh, scaffolding, handholding can be provided? I think Mukesh, you should start with this. <laughs> Actually, training models also have to change. Uh, earlier we used to have face-to-face uh, -face model. Uh, I think best way to uh, have the training is the large group should be assigned some task in be beginning. And uh, in middle, they should be asked to s give some inputs about that. And every input should be different from their mind, right? And after that, they should be called for such kind of training, 
right? Where you already know that this is the level of the people and accordingly the training is given. And every single training we do, we should be documenting it, as I told you. That uh, documentation help is uh, us to carry it forward to the next level, right? Right now, we have so many tools. It can be documented very easily. Whatever we are speaking can be t converted into text and then fine-tuned by somebody and then uh, flushed. Now, the major problem what comes in such kind of training is training is over and then you forget about it, right? And the training material is a uh, huge one and that is why you are not able to read it back when you go back. So it should have only point system. Broad points, most of the people are able to remember. It is just that paragraph and sentences you forget. So it is better that from every training, the major chunk should be taken out and recirculated. And then they should be asked to give feedbacks regularly. Right, so feedback is very important because once the feedback comes, one, you, uh, you are unsure that uh, somebody who has learned from this training is carrying it forward, right? Otherwise, you never come to know that it has been implemented and what has happened after that, right? So that kind of statistical data, if we keep on monitoring, and this is what has happened. And somebody who is giving good feedbacks can be asked to further get involved in the process of training others, that yeah. kind of thing, I think. So, so uh, maybe uh, Rita, I would like to ask you, since you spoke about uh, working with SAN students earlier, yes. what yes. do you think could be the training needs for uh, teachers in other disciplines? Yes. So training is always uh, important because when we are implementing something new, because every time we are getting new set of teachers, you know, and we have to implement that new thing among the teachers so their mindset should be ready to accept new things. I think this is most important that they should be prepared by their mind only that I have to learn. So when they are, they themselves are ready to learn something new, so it will be very easy to implement anything or give a training. And of course, after giving training in a constructive manner where we are asking them, we are expecting same thing regarding CT if we are talking. We are expecting children should go like this. So same thing can be happen with the teachers also by giving them tasks and solving through all these CT skills. So let the uh, observe the result and then you can go for the implementation, follow up of the training. That is also very, very important, even though they have learned, but actually if it is not followed in the classroom, what is plus, what is minus, maybe it will not be 100% implemented. First, in first attempt, they may get fail and uh, they will not reach to the correct solution. But definitely if they try once again, then they can go. And they can discuss also among the you know, teachers, there should be a discussion that what they have done, how they have implemented. So they will come with plus and minus points and they can refine the training process and they can go ahead with the implementation. That is what I think. So, so Varad, I think when you talk about, I don't know if any, after you do or you and others would like to touch upon, I think one of the questions that also uh, asked in this was, how do you avoid falling into the same trap that the other countries have fallen? They have tried something similar. They have gone through a process where they have done all of these, but there still are uh, issues with respect to teachers adopting it, right? So if you could also touch upon that part of it. Uh, so I'll just cover a little bit about the previous point and then get on to this. So uh, a lot of what uh, Rita Mam said kind of resonated with what I had kind of thought about this. I think in addition to the uh, domain-based training that we need to provide to teachers, two or three things that we need to kind of help them do better is how do we make teachers more curious? And this is something that stu kids kind of do naturally, right? But as we become adults, we kind of get into this frame of, I know my subject, and now all I need to do is kind of impart that knowledge to students. But if we, tan if we can retain that curiosity in us, and at the same time also not have that fear of new t new things that are happening out there. There is new technology coming in pretty much, I mean, last few decades have sh shown it and uh, people kind of start off with that about how innovation has been fairly rapid and promises to be so in the near future as well. 
as teachers, how do we have retain that curiosity? How do we not fear new technology but embrace that to kind of try explore how we can combine that with the knowledge that we have to do better? And uh, I, the third thing I was going to say was something that Rita I already mentioned. Can, how often and how well can we share practices, good practices, something that didn't work? And I think this conference kind of yeah, works well with that. Both these days where teachers are coming in and presenting how think, uh, their application of teaching CT in schools have worked, I think the more we can do of this, the more that inhibition is going to reduce. And I'm, I'm saying this not just from a teacher point of view. At EI, we have content creators that we kind of encourage to think of it through in these lenses. Uh, so that was about the previous question. And uh, as for the uh, avoiding the trap that other countries have kind of fallen to, I think, yes, there is a sense to kind of pick up a buzzword and say that, OK, this is the thing that I need to kind of crack. And it makes nice headlines to say that, Computational thinking is the new math, and this will uh, create so many jobs. So it's easy to make those headlines, but to actually do the rigorous work of making changes happen is going to need a lot more work, uh, is going to need a lot of stakeholders to come together. We need parents, we need teachers, we need school leaders to kind of look at uh, the different things that a student is going to need to succeed in their life, and therefore how we have to be willing to look at newer aspects of both teaching kids, training teachers, and s setting them both up for success. And as much as, I mean, there are challenges in that, but I think there are also good case studies to see. Uh, in the UAE, uh, based on PISA performance, uh, UAE kind of picked it up as a target saying, we will want to do better in PISA in the coming years. And in the last 15 years, they've put up fairly rigorous systems and processes. So every school is required to have an external party evaluate how their kids are learning key concepts. The uh, KHD, the school regulator there, sends in independent third party inspection teams into the schools to evaluate them. And they've created this nice framework to kind of not only teach English math science, but also to kind of tr help schools to get better. So I think there are some of those lines that we can also pick up and try and see how we can apply as a nation in CT. Sure, thank you. OK. I actually feel quite sorry for teachers. So many demands on teachers. Today you're in a CT thing, you have to do this. Tomorrow you'll be in a citizenship thing. And you know, it's an impossible task. Right? So how to make it possible? I want to talk about that. Uh, and it'll, I, maybe there are some principals and, you know, uh, HODs here. So we are working with about more than 50 math and science teachers in an in international school in Bangalore, last two and a half years, continue to work. So it's really, I think uh, the way to make this work is, first of all, see that as a school, can we work jointly as a team to address this issue? This involves various things. For example, I am not fully convinced that all the things teachers are doing today, they need to do. Okay, so some things have to be taken off their plate. Um, and uh, so, so for example, it is one thing to say that, you know, we'll do CT and this thing, and we've so far not answered what exactly, how will we assess, maybe it'll come up. So while somebody will give you a curriculum, CS Patshala will give you a very good curriculum, but you still need to make it your own. You need to figure out who can teach this, who will learn it. Some teachers, it's perfectly fine that they become curious and open, like Varad said. So you are part of a community where you learn. So teachers' openness is important. Like, you know, there'll be some bright students will be ahead of you. They, they've grown up. Like, there were smartphones and there were babies, right? And we have grown up in a different uh, world. So I think what is required is, um, First, the leader, the school principal management has to clarify what exactly uh, we are going to do, what, are, what is more important, what is less important, uh, what do we do initially, what do we deal later. For example, I would say that a lot of schools and as a society, we lose the battle by the time the child is 10 or 11 because we think more is better. 
जिसे कि ये भी कर लो वो भी कर लो ईवीएस भी कर लो भी कर लो इफ अ चाइल्ड कैन जस्ट डू अ फ्यू थिंग्स कैन लर्न टू राइट अ पेज ऑन हिज और हर ओन ऑन समथिंग ऑन देयर ओन यू नो अबाउट समथिंग दे डू इफ दे लर्न बेसिक मैथ मे बी सम ऑफ दीज क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग यू नो द अर्ली सी एस पाठशाल काइंड ऑफ थिंग दे विल डेवलप इंटेंसिंग मोटिवेशन दे विल लव लर्निंग यू डोंट रन बिहाइंड द चाइल्ड and whatever we do there is so much to be learned in today's world that unless the learner takes responsibility for their own learning they will not then they will make choices somebody will do more of ct somebody will do more of history so we have fallen into this trap as a system that we think ki teacher padhayega to bachcha sikhega right so i mean i'm going a little bit off topic but this is the situation uh, i see so and i think uh experienced teachers are under leveraged in schools uh there should be a clear definition whether it is an hod or you call it a teacher champion because uh, some teachers have spent 10 15 years learning this they have the experience they know how to if if i go into a class i can't manage fourth standard students if i go into a ninth standard class i may know the subject even better than the teacher but i can't do in 35 minutes what the teacher does so i am not very sure and like he was talking about documentation whether schools have managed to capture best practices so i find schools generally quite poor i'm making a strong statement you probably have most of the answers within your school where some teachers are managing to do something very well in fact i would say teachers should learn so if you're a computer science teacher you might you know uh, do ct the way he's talking about but if you are a language teacher or you know biology teacher or something else in your own work are you developing ct skills are you putting data in excel are you sorting it are you using conditional formatting i would rather train my teachers on that to develop ct than you know get them into check sum and this and that and stuff like that if that is not their subject no i think common theme that seems to be emerging is yeah. we need a community of practice a community of practice yeah. like what we have at ctis the other thing that i think uh, so taking from there you said schools also have answers to probably yeah. what is yeah. required they have that right yeah. how do we translate that into scale the we have multiple education systems here when i say education systems i'm referring to private versus government uh, uh, and uh, all the Uh, things associated with that right that we have a large number of teachers who need to be trained any thoughts on how do we translate this or anything else that we need to do for actually the there are certain things which are common in all boards right there are certain things which are different so we need to identify which are the common things right so for common things we will be having thousands of solutions there will be some specific things which are required to be done in the school level which is school related only actually uh, because of the policy of your school certain things are done in certain ways so we have to identify whatever is common you just take the best practices from anywhere and whatever is specific thing try to find out which other school has similar kind of issue and how they have resolved it so this is going to be uh the thing and best thing will be if you uh, i'll just make a statement if you can't learn the way i teach i will teach the way you learn so this is what is going to be future right because every child now diversity will increase uh, in times to come diversity will increase the variation of the level of the children will increase right you have to be ready for that you have to accept that change in the society after pandemic especially teachers have at least moved to technology and no teacher i i can uh, say with uh, full confidence that no teacher in the world entire world is there who are, is afraid of technology now we should take the full advantage of chat gpt we should take full advantage of open ai to find out solutions to our own problems unless until you will start using this kind of tools which are going to simplify your life whatever you do in 7 days you can reduce it down to almost 10 to 15 minutes right 99% of the solutions are already there right which you face i am not talking about the all solutions of the world but yes your kind of situation whatever kind of problems you want to make today you want to make a presentation on certain thing you can just ask chat gpt to give pointers or 
make the full presentation right so you don't have to invest time on that so teachers should learn uh, how to do things smartly rather than it, in investing time in unnecessary things data analytics you want to uh, arrange data in a certain order or uh, pick up certain uh, uh, for that also chat gpt will give you beautiful answers right there are tools available uh, in open ai which can help you to find out formula for doing this it will tell you exactly to how to do it so you don't have to invest time in so i don't think for everything you require training you have to self train and self train model will best work because everyone will be working at different level your level is different your colleague level is different right so you have to see where you are and from there you have to start picking things so until unless teachers will come in the self learn mode what he suggested that children should go in the self learn mode it will not happen right whatever you do they will copy right so you should start self learning 90% of the things you will be able to learn whatever is left find out what training where it is happening do that training everyone can't invest one or two days on every training right it is not possible right every teacher cannot be allowed to move out and do training P principals will not allow right management will not allow so you have to identify this is the area where you require training so you make sure that you pass on this information to your management and school that this is what you require to learn you are not able to learn it from the available resources so that will be the best model i think uh, thanks no it's a very interesting thing when you say self learning i'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on the the time at hand available to teachers from different systems here so you being or teachers from a private school system do they have more time at hand to learn as compared to the requirements of a government school teacher the various tasks they have to perform for the government and uh, do you think there is sufficient room for them to uh, self learn uh, maybe uh, rita if you could give some few comments with respect to ct if you are asking so um, as uh, it is mentioned that they have to be trained so uh, teachers are doing these all things on regular basis i don't think this is very new for them because everywhere when teacher is there in the class there is a problem solving and she needs to deal with that so only what we are doing through ct they are learning how to do it in a structured manner so that it will save their time they will uh, come up with more solutions and easy approach so that they need to learn otherwise they are doing all these things city skills throughout their teaching process throughout their uh, learning then whatever even the program committee if it is made they have to design the set of instructions and algorithm for that and how the ne she needs to go that they are already doing so we have to make them only aware for that and uh, we have to turn into a systematic approach towards this uh, process that is what ct they have to learn and uh, yes as sir mentioned there is uh, time constraint is also there so nowadays many things are available online so you need not to present for every training physically so that can be managed in that way also and uh, now this is also a city conference which is going on it is one of the example of training program only before the previous stage which happened before this conference many teachers from one school were involved and they have worked on this process so this in small small chunk if training is going on so they are getting educated towards city also i think to answer to the uh, to speak to the systemic change that you were also looking at i think while these conferences will help to kind of take it to a larger fr uh, frame i think the more we are able to engage some of the larger stakeholders like if some of the leading exam agencies came out and encouraged teachers and schools to do uh, uh, to do more of this i think those are things that will have an impact and you refer to nep in the beginning there is a thrust towards computational thinking in nep to improve the way we are uh, teaching different concepts so to the extent that we are able to align this with national priorities i think recently foundational literacy and numeracy has kind of taken a lot of precedence because 
it has come from the, uh, right from the prime minister to that this is the priority for the uh, country and the more we are able to engage with and impress stakeholders to say see this as an immediate priority i think the more we are uh, larger scale success we can achieve on that so uh, no i think that's an interesting point you bring out foundation literacy and numeracy and if you were just to change the context of this conversation and say that where there are enough uh, reports that show that we are weak in that area. Our, uh, that's an area for us to work upon. And as you said, that that's also government's focus. Uh, any very, uh, just one very quick comment, maybe one on what is the impact of uh, lack of FLN skills, or I should say weakness in that area on learning CT? Very quickly, if somebody would like to just comment on it. Can I first uh, answer to your Previous question in just sure. one minute. Okay. How many of you have open AI account with you? Uh, Bukesh, one minute, one minute. Yeah. I have a section on that. Maybe we okay, can come okay. to that later. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, this question is about FLN and maybe Varat, would you like to answer this? So, uh, yeah, I think one of the ways that CT is going to be taught in schools is using skills that you already have mm -hmm. and to the extent that foundational skills are missing if a student is struggling to read or if a student is struggling to compute uh, basic mathematical operations to use language or math as a computational thinking medium to help them achieve CT skills is going to have its limitations but I think the beauty of CT is also that it's not limited to only those two domains right you could I mean, if you go to code.org, there are puzzles that encourage students to draw things out and use art as a way to impart CT. So yes, FLN, I mean, this is not to deal, uh, emphasize on FLN. Foundational literacy is important, numeracy is important. But they don't need to be roadblocks to, OK, because we've not achieved FLN, let's first focus on that, and then we will solve for CT later. We will still need to crack both. And CT provides for those different parallel avenues to still achieve that while we are still working on FLN. Yeah, great. Thanks. I think I think I'll, that's a great uh, way to look at it. I think one of the most burning questions that most teachers here, I'm sure, in this room and elsewhere have is now that we are looking at CT, how do we assess students? Right. We talk about different skills here. We talk about uh, different elements that were came up earlier. Uh, Mukesh spoke about things earlier. Uh, a lot of literature, if you look at it, focuses on assessing CT from a programmatic perspective. Like you talk about sequencing or you talk about some of these things. Uh, some other people speak about other skills, decomposition, abstraction, and other things. Now, how do you assess these skills in the schools, right, in the students? Is assessing each skill, uh, so is it equal to you know, whole is it equal to sum of parts? If you are looking at the skills individually, does it mean that a pr person who is able to do well here can also solve problems? Uh, I wanted to. I was curious to get your thoughts on uh, this area, and specifically, what are you doing at EI on uh, CT assessment? So, uh, the way we've looked at assessment in other subjects is also to s uh, pose questions that a student is not too familiar with. So, we believe in the power of asking good questions that go to the core of whether a concept has been understood or not. It works clearly, I mean, it's easy to kind of see how that pans out in a math or a science uh, based assessment. But in CT, the way we are kind of approaching it is, can we have the student engage with questions that need the students to apply CT skills, but in fairly different contexts that they've not probably dealt with too much. So uh, the way we do, uh, I mean, I, I should uh, preface this with we've just started working on this, so there is a lot more to be learned in this space. But the way we are currently thinking through this is that we will pick contexts that see, that are in, uh, naturally relevant for the students and something that they want to kind of uh, play around with, as Vishnu put it. And in those contexts, then ask questions. And if you ask a bunch of questions in different contexts that talk about some of the skills that we have, pattern recognition, decomposition, etc., we are able to kind of give a sense to the teacher. And we believe a lot in ha using assessments as providing relevant information to teachers in terms of how they can solve for that in the classroom. 
so if we are able to guide teachers that students who have otherwise done well in a science assessment are not doing as well when they are applying CT in a science domain, could that be scope for us engaging with the teachers to say that these are some of the practice activities that you could look at and therefore not look at it as assessment as a way of measuring and coming up with a number but as a way of changing behavior in terms of both for the teacher as well as for the student to see that yes this is where we are and these are some of the ways in which we can solve for that so that is largely how we look at assessment especially for ct So you take any subject, I think one of the challenges in assessment is what exactly is this child supposed to learn, right? And only if I'm able to clarify that, that can I assess it properly, otherwise I may be assessing something else, not. So yesterday I liked, uh, I think, presentation by a Kalmadi school teacher where she talked about the facial uh, recognition thing, right? And initially they used these cartoon characters, there were fewer attributes, then they tried it with photos of actual kids of many more attributes. So, so I'm actually curious that is the teacher able to articulate what exactly is being learned and assess and by assessment I'm talking not just about the end of period assessment like a formative assessment right when you go into the classroom do you know how you are going to get evidence of whether the child you know uh, learnt uh, uh, that thing. Uh, so to my mind it is not a trivial exercise. Uh, we in our teacher training with our teachers, uh, we use a framework called understanding by design. Um, so actually even a discussion around what exactly has to be learnt and how will we get evidence that they have learnt it uh, will help a lot in over a period of time improving the quality of these assessments. Okay, so I think I'm just looking at the time also right now. So maybe uh, let me jump to the next one uh, before we open it up for questions from the audience. So we started this discussion quoting Janet Wing and uh, 2006 is when she wrote the initial uh, article. She followed it up 10 years later in 2016 with another article uh, where she said, okay, what has been the journey? Uh, what has been the progress on computer science education, CT education in K-12? I think one of the things they mentions in that is that she was pleasantly surprised with the project, the progress that was made. She did not expect that kind of a project. You know, if in tw in I think she in 2009 she is quoted as having saying that I don't think this is going to happen in my lifetime. Right? And here we are, uh, in 10 years from when she started, a lot of a lot of people have been talking about it, countries have started implementing it, but this was 2016. So that was 10 years from when this kind of, all this, uh, f the floodgates opened up. Where do you see it 25 years from then? That is 2006 or in 2031, right? Another uh, six or seven years, seven or eight years from now. Where do you think, where do you see CT? And I'd like to just open it to everyone. Okay, I won't be foolish enough to <laughs> say where CT will be because, you know, 10 months ago we didn't have chat GPT and, uh, you know, uh, brilliant computer scientists were completely surprised. So, I'm not going to be foolish enough to try to say. Uh, so, but, uh, but uh, what I want to talk about is this is posing, uh, we have a lot of challenges on this planet, right, whether it is climate change, whether it is uh, food security, there, there are so many uh, challenges. And while AI and CT is hopefully going to help to solve and address some of these problems, it is also adding to some of these problems, right? So today, how do you know whether you are talking to a human being or an AI bot? It is almost impossible. Or there are ways till now that smart computer scientists and you know people are able to make out but very soon even that may uh, go away it may be almost impossible to make out so so there are huge risks so when we talk about what should be learned so i'm going to talk more from the perspective of for the future what should be learned right so one is certainly every so the task of being a good citizen itself has become much more difficult 
with uh, you know all of these things so you need to understand you need to at least appreciate that this is how you know this thing does it and you need to understand while chat gpt can really help you save your time and give you some answers you still need to know that only a good teacher can really use chat gpt well right only a good computer scientist can get it to you know uh, uh, write good code and leverage it so uh, and and the reason i'm saying this is there's a lot of buzz right people get carried away by these fads so that is one point i want to make the other thing which i want to make it's a pet topic of mine is uh, one of the reasons for a lot of problems in the world we face today is because of the complexity of things like i, I took the example of traffic some time ago right so i will think okay let me build better roads more flyovers you know things like that and then you know the traffic uh, situation will come down it doesn't happen there is a second order effect so now you know people will start building outside pune or outside bangalore wherever you live the roads will go till there people will build a township there so people are now coming larger distances more cars are coming on the road because there are uh, more roads so this is a second order effect so a affected b b affected c and c may affect a so unfortunately our intuition is not very good at understanding non linear cyclical there is a very beautiful book called learning causality in a complex uh, world and ct and simulation tools can help you so i've used a tool called loopy if you go to l o o p y and use it i did a two week course with kids and so easily they were able to figure out how things amplify and so in my mind educating our intuition to deal with the complex nature of things there's a whole discipline called systems thinking so whether it is public policy how to you know or climate change or what or governance so i do think that and systems thinking has been mentioned in some of the ct goals i've seen so to my mind we as educators must also use ct for that so that's my limited thing the last thing i want to talk about uh, so as we speak uh, some of our faculty are training a bunch of teachers on uh, open ai using it for math teaching and if you can use it well it gives you brilliant results i'll give you an example so you, i am uh, say they are going to teach statistics using you know mean median mode and all these things and because i have some knowledge of these things i, I was trying it out before the teacher training so i asked the things that i don't want to introduce these terms technically first i want my students to get an intuitive understanding of these ideas before i introduce the formal terms can you please give me some suggestions it gave me brilliant suggestions before that it gave me nothing great a, a, a good teacher would have done much better than that but because i had some context and i asked it could do that so i really liked a couple of points of what uh, mukesh said so one is why don't you free up your own time by using some of these tools and the community of practice at least for a start within the school and then go out of the school there are people who are uh, doing these things so that's my limited thing i'm sure some of you have point so basically i would like to emphasize on one very important point that future cannot be predicted because whatever you said that uh, uh, in 2009 this prediction was such and that didn't happen it went very fast and it will be faster in future so we can't exactly predict what will happen after certain number of years but yes at present whatever is available based on that we can prepare ourselves better right why i was asking you uh, how many of you have open ai plate uh, account has uh, some very very important thing for that how many of you have open ai account here many of you okay so he was asking you the uh, how a teacher will take out time so right now your teaching time cannot be reduced your 40 periods or 35 periods or 50 period uh, 50 minutes period whatever is that with that will remain there but apart from that whatever extra work you do that you can reduce down on your own 
right? Try to figure out what takes maximum time. Try to figure out how to reduce that time so that you get more time from the same time schedule and do other things, right? All of you can do that, right? It is very simple. Your teaching time cannot be reduced. That is scheduled in the timetable. But apart from that, whatever work you do, I think you can reduce that down by six to seven hours at least. And you can figure out on your own also. There is no need to consult anyone. You just find out what takes maximum time in your school other than teaching. Whether it is analyzing thing. And uh, at the end, I can just uh, share with you a list of tools which can simplify your life. Right? Uh, I, I, I'll pass it on to uh, organizers. They will pass it on to you. Right? It will simplify your life. Right, whether you want to design something, whether you want to uh, code something, whether you want to find out formula for something, for everything there is a tool available. So you don't have to go to 10 different places. You just click there and just reduce your workload. Right? Thank you. Uh, Varath, you had some comments on generative AI. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So uh, I'll also root it in the larger context as I see it. Uh, and also try and take a shot at the eight-year question that you asked. So uh, what we've seen in the last few months kind of gives a window of what can be possible, right? So we had Sal Khan from Khan Academy talking about how uh, what was called that Bloom's Two Sigma problem, wh where back I think in the 1970s, there was a research done to show that irrespective of what teaching interventions you do, the best way to teach and to uh, get a learning impact is to have one is to one tutoring, one teacher per student. And so in 1970s, when this paper was published by Bloom, he put it as a two sigma problem because it can't be scaled. And what Khan Academy and others with uh, the new tech that is coming up are trying to kind of look at is can we use AI to get a better sense of what where each individual student is. Yes, we have a classroom of 30, 40 students, but can we use these new tech tools to te speak to each of these students as if we had a teaching assistant sitting right there with each student? And could that transform education? We still don't know if this can be done, but this kind of provides an interesting way to kind of see how things could change in the near future. The two other things that I wanted to kind of mention was uh, some of, th I mean, I couldn't attend yesterday's sessions here because we had an, uh, we've been having an all company event back uh, in Bangalore and some of the sessions that we did, one new thing that we've incorporated into our English learning product that we call MindSpark English is something that we call a story builder, which uses chat GPT. And what, I mean, I've seen the, pro uh, the product as it was being developed last few weeks. And I had my doubts. I'll, I'll be straightforward. I mean, what it does is basically you get the kid to pick a character. So it can be any animal. You give it a context. You give it certain basic inputs. And you use ChatGPT to create the story. And we also used DALI to create images for the story. And we had questions that were created based on the passage. So we created an entire reading comprehension exercise based on what the student picked. To me, the power of it came alive when we presented to three different audiences, all internal at EI, but these are all adults, and you should have seen how excited they were that the choices they made, they felt like they had co-written that story. They were invested in that story so much to say that they, I mean, the excitement level of going through a reading comprehension passage and answering questions, I wouldn't have expected that AI can solve for that. And if it can do that for adults, clearly students who can make stories of their own, place themselves in the center of the story, and make a story of, out of that, I think the possibilities are fairly endless in the use of AI to change the way education happens. And I'm, I'm still talking about education in a very broad perspective not just limiting it to CT, but that kind of applies to CT as well. And the third last point I wanted to mention was 
uh, one of the guest speakers we had was uh, Mr. Shrikant Nadamani, the CTO of, uh, who was the CTO of Aadhaar when it was conceptualized and implemented. And he was talking about one of his more recent projects in Assam, where they're having, uh, they, they've set up these 10 bed ICUs across the country. And in Assam, they're coming up with this project where through telemedicine and AI, in the night, if the nurse doesn't have a specialist there, they've trained a specific LLM that is that is actually saving lives right now, where your the nurse is telling the uh, AI tool that this is the scenario and the patient's BP has dropped. What do I do? And the uh, AI, which has been trained on uh, medical uh, uh, corpus of knowledge that. Uh, this organization has provided is able to specify that this is the medicine to be taken and this is the dosage and then the nurse comes back three hours later saying I tried that it didn't work what do I do and this is how they're able to solve for it and again to clarify this is not chat GPT chat GPT is has its own set of problems in terms of whether information it provides is correct or not more so in the medical field but an AI solution that is trained on expert knowledge can change the way things happen. And I think a lot of that we will see not just in the education space, but elsewhere. And one of the newer ways in which I've seen Silicon Valley people talk about AI is the way mobiles have become the way we interact with devices. I mean, the way we interact with devices has changed with internet and then with mobiles. And the expectation now is that with AI and not just generative AI or chat GPT, there is going to be a lot of different ways in which humans interact with computers. And when that changes, the both the way to learn computational thinking, apply computational thinking, or even explore computational thinking is going to significantly change. And I think as long as we can all be part of the journey along with our students, I think we will get there to a space in eight years where not only have we solved education as a problem, but also computational thinking as a skill that everyone has to have. Thank you. Uh, I think this has been a very engaging conversation. I'm sure we can go on for long. Uh, but I think I'm just respecting time and uh, maybe I would like to open it up for a few questions to the audience. Uh, I think just before I do that, since we have been talking about LLMs and the use of uh, AI, uh, I don't know how many of you have looked at uh, Khan Migo. A uh, very, very small uh, uh, raise of hands, but I'll, I'll encourage you to all look at Khan Migo and see how Khan Academy has uh, incorporated uh, LLMs into uh, learning, both teacher modes and students more, where students and teachers can explore more on any topic they are uh, looking at. Uh, I think, let me, let me open it up further to any questions from the audience uh, for the panelists. <laughs> Uh, thank you, um, the panelists here. Um, I have few observations from the field of education. Uh, one is, today schools are consumers of knowledge, as um, Vishnu just now shared with us. The second thing which, um, from the panel, what we are trying to understand is where we are today what is the future going to be and what is the line of action that we need to do, take. The, these are the three um, observations that I've made from the session. So today schools are consumers of knowledge and we are very good at that. What schools need to do is design lessons in all subjects to help children learn to think individually is what I feel is missing. Because we are uh, wearing our own hats and uh, this is one area. How does a child think individually? Because we have a classroom, come what may, there are 40, there are 80 children in one classroom. So that is a big major concern, but we cannot ignore that. We have to take that into consideration and accordingly we have to understand that what needs to be done. 
So when we have different abilities in the classroom, how do you address this concept of making every child think? How can each child think individually is another thing. Think differently. How do you enhance thinking from rote learning? How do you take the child? And how do you make every child think individually is one more thing. How can we become constructors and producers of knowledge? That is another major dimension that we need to take care of. So here, certain processes need to be included. And I think computational thinking is a wonderful process. Because as you all were talking, I just felt we Indians, our brains are actually tuned to computational thinking without knowing. Suppose there was no electricity and these mics were not working. I'm sure without getting ruffled, we would have done something. So we are very good at that. Indians are very good at that. Especially in Indian schools, it is computational thinking is a wonderful logical bridge. I say it logical bridge between the traditional way of teaching and what is needed today in this computational world. So I think as educators, we need to place this concept forward to our um, teachers, that computational thinking is not something which the teachers are not familiar. What the teachers are not familiar is only the process. So if we can define the process with take the te teachers from simple to complex problem solving um, linear way of taking them, I'm sure they will take it into their classrooms. And I would like to give one example. During the COVID that I've tried out, we could not go out. So when you were talking about developing a story, so whatever was in the garden, I shared it with my grandchildren and said, let's create a story. Every day we'll, we'll create story from all the uh, things available in the garden. So art can be included when they are very small. And that same thing could go into problem solving. So computational thinking has come to stay. Computational thinking was there already with us. So how do you unwrap computational thinking so that it does not become a foreign body that you're trying to adjust into your educational system? What we need to do in our educational system is only change the mindset from trying to teach our children. We have to facilitate and no longer teach. So I think that vocabulary we use in our classrooms needs to change. So I thank you all for your wisdom in this field. And I'm sure uh, with CS Patishala, it's not going to be very difficult to be uh, reaching every corner of India. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ram, for your comments. There are two or three questions. I don't know. Somebody will have to give me a pointer on time. Uh, I have uh, two questions. The first one is, कि इसके पहले हमने जो पढ़ा है कुछ और trainings भी ली हैं उसमें uh, do, uh, learning by doing, activity activity based learning और uh, इस टाइप के काफी कुछ चीजें सीखी हैं so CT is से different कैसे है क्योंकि हमने काफी कुछ कल जो examples देखे उसमें यही था कि भई हम activities के through learn कर रहे हैं so first question is that No, I think let them answer this question first, I think, yeah. So, uh, I mean, one core difference I see between the two is that learning by doing, largely we are looking at that underlying concept being learned. So, if say I want to learn something about temperature and I have something hot, something cold, some activity that I'm able to design around that, that is uh, explicitly designed so that the uh, student understands the 
concept behind temperature there. Whereas if I am able to come up with another activity that builds on that and says that, okay, now that you've learned this, can we build another activity that will look at not learning about temperature, but using this knowledge that I have now about temperature to apply it in a computational thinking sense. So it could be, say, for some um, example, if we had, I mean, if if we just limited to data analysis, we could just make it a larger sample size and try and see if students can infer something from different objects. So if you, I mean, I'm just going to think off the top of my head. So if you, instead of just two objects that you have cold and hot, now you make up 20 objects that you don't have immediate, uh, I mean, you don't know the temperature of, and you still have to find, say, the hottest, what would be the way to go about that? So that is a question that, I mean, activity that deals with the CT part of it, that uses temperature as a concept, as a science concept that the student might have learned. So we are not necessarily teaching temperature, but definitely by going through that activity, the student is going to absorb the concepts underlying temperature a lot more while also learning the CT part of it. Uh, thank you, Arath. I've already been show, shown the red card, so we have perhaps one last question we can take. The The panelists will be around after that, so I'm sure all of you can reach out to the panelists. I, mean, I know there are questions here, but I think we'll have to just, in the instead of time, maybe take it up uh, later. Do we have time for that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great discussion, great thought-provoking discussion. Uh, last 24 hours have been uh, have been very uh, interesting, and a lot of new ideas have come up. And uh, I do not come from a background of great expertise in education. I'm a teacher student, uh, but I feel that I need to ask this question and. Uh, Yesterday we went to science activity centers also and we have been seeing all the presentations given by our teachers and in the panel discussion as well. We have talked about how activities are play very important role in CT. And we did talk about assessments as well and I think Vishnu sir raised this point that to assess we first need to know what we are trying to teach or what we are trying to learn in the class. and. Uh, uh, and being a teacher student, every day I come across different wa uh, ways of practicing teaching and how to uh, make classes more interesting. I think, uh, how, how do we ensure that in between of all of these, the students are learning? We are not getting flown away in the creativity or the fascination of the activities. Yeah, I think it's a great and important question and a good note to end on. And uh, I will also add to what Varath was answering. So the activities which were happening yesterday were very deeply thought out. So what Professor uh, Hura or who was doing, they pointed out that it was not some random card picking up this thing. That there was a whole thing about sorting it. See, it may have been a lot for some of us to process who are not computer science teachers. But... Um, uh, Activity is one way of learning. It can be there in any topic, whether it's temperature or computational thinking or whatever. And I agree with the person who asked the question that is very easy to get carried away. That activity hua, bache khush hue, humko bhi bhot masti aya. Lekin sikha kya? Right? So to get that evidence of the understanding, so I strongly encourage you to, I mean, maybe I'll share a blog post written on it, but this is a very beautiful framework. Understanding by Design by Grant Wiggins and J. McTeague. So they have a suggestion about this. They say that, so it's called a backward design model. So what they, uh, and, and why is it called understanding by design? Understanding can happen by accident. Right, kuch kuch kiya, kisi ne wo samaj liya ki ye binary sort ye tha. Kisi ne socha ye to basti wala activity ye kuch aur soch liya, right? So by design, carefully, consciously, can we make understanding happen? So what they recommend is that first you become very clear about your goal, right? So even before you start working with their activity, you say ki children should understand that only if they sort something, 
only then will this binary search work something like that right there could be a, an easier thing which you take and after that you don't design the learning activity you figure out how will i get evidence of understanding and this has to be collaborative activity you have to discuss with other teachers sometimes because it's not very easy and obvious the answer so i think it's a great question the answer is complicated and uh, but i think you know uh, and we can over tea uh, coffee chat about some of these things but yes i'm going to stop there i pleaded with nikhil and he said okay there's room for one more question so uh, uh, yeah i think there's a mic with somebody if you could yeah हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन सरकार ने अभी हाल ही में एन ई पी इंट्रोड्यूस किया है uh, उसमें क्लास सिक्स से कोडिंग को uh, सिखाने का uh, बोला है तो कॉम्पिटिशनल थिंकिंग एंड कोडिंग कोडिंग बाद में आता है पहले कॉम्पिटिशनल थिंकिंग आता है सो so, uh, उसका सिलेबस या करिकुलम उसका कैसा होना चाहिए या कैसे सीखना चाहिए हाउ डू यू फाइंड दैट सो आई मीन i'll just share again our initial thoughts on how we are thinking about teaching computational thinking through the product that we're building uh, we are saying from early earlier ages even before class 6 we want to start with a focus on puzzles as such puzzles and linguistic games that we can create where again the uh, idea is to have different contexts that a student has to understand apply their games uh, apply their skills uh, i mean let me put it very simply right if uh, some of us may have pl uh, played wordle or let's say sudoku how do how do we learn to play sudoku the first time we see it we try something out over multiple such attempts our brain comes up with a heuristic a potential set of steps that we should take when we see a new sudoku puzzle so the idea that we have is that we will have different puzzles it's not you don't want the kid to learn only sudoku or only say chess which if you go in that direction but can you sh have the kid play different types of puzzles different complexity levels so it is fun it is interactive but just by go investing their time and learning different skills embedded in those puzzles can they pick up some of the ct skills right up front and then can we take them to something like a block based coding and then get into uh, actual programming as well and the larger i mean this is more of an aspiration right now we will have to see how we are able to do it but it is also about how we can help kids absorb new tech so given that there are a bunch of different new technology that have come up in the last 20 30 years and we think that i mean that's only going to increase in the next few, a couple of decades can we introduce new different aspects of new technology they don't have to fully understand quantum computing but if you take a thread out there and present it to them in a way that they understand and they are able to apply that in their own world hopefully when the next big thing comes when they are out there they will be in a better position because they've seen that ha huh, okay these are 10 different new things that have come up it's not like uh, newton's laws are there ye padhana hai seekhna hai rather this is something that is still emerging and how do you then judge how well to use it even chat gpt to that extent how do you trust the information that is coming so those are things that i mean these are some of the buckets into which we are thinking we will use to impart computational thinking the one part that i missed mentioning is also what uh, rita ma'am also mentioned earlier about integrating it with, with other subjects so cross curricular computing as we are calling it if we can have computing as a way to use what students have learned in other domains to uh, engage with ct as well so these are some of the ways of visual thinking okay yeah so i think uh, with that we'll uh, close this panel discussion uh, i'm sure the panelists are available you can ask them the questions after this uh, i think it was very engaging and very interesting session personally a lot of learning for me uh one thing i remember when vishnu started he spoke about giving me the traffic problem of pune to solve it just shows that he is not from pune because it's an impossible problem to solve <laughs> with that i'd like to thank uh, rita varat yes, mukesh <laughs> and vishnu thank you so much i uh, really appreciate your time and uh, sharing your thoughts with us thank you very much
Thank you, Vipul, and thank you all the panelists for a very engaging panel discussion. Let's have a very big round of applause for all of them again, please. Very insightful. So as we know, uh, we have to sacrifice something for the other, you know. Uh, so we will sacrifice some time for tea. So we will be back at 11.05. Uh, okay, I give you five minutes extra. And uh, But while you are at tea, I would encourage you to take a look at all the posters. We have a very interesting set of posters called Misconceptions in CT. Uh, they have been put up at the other end uh, of the stalls. So you should take a look at that because you know there are a lot of things which we probably figure out that CT might, what does CT actually do, but what doesn't, what doesn't CT do is what those posters will explain. So just go and take a look at that. We'll see you at 11.05. Thank you. <laughs>